Hello again, it's Paul. Um, part two of our talk today is about uh, pain, anxiety, and sedation. So objectives here. Um, let's talk a little bit about pain in the intensive care unit. Remember that um, pain is a pretty um, complex thing. Uh, it seems easy to understand that uh, somebody has pain and we need to fix it. But the whole process of pain can be um, very complex to understand. It has to include uh, not only the pain stimulus, but also um, all of the other things that go along with that stimulus that may enhance the pain. It also has to, um, in order for somebody to experience pain, they have to uh, sense the pain. So there has to be the stimulus. It has to be transmitted to the brain so that it can be interpreted as pain. Uh, and there are other things along the way that, um, that may complicate matters, such as as sleep hygiene or lack thereof in the intensive care unit, uh, muscle tenseness, uh, other disease processes, uh, somebody's depression can certainly have a huge impact on the um, sensation of pain. Things that contribute to pain in the intensive care unit in particular are uh, all the invasive lines and tubes and drains and such that we have, the routine care that we have to provide to patients, which, by the way, interrupts their sleep patterns, uh, and turning patients and, um, uh, and futzing with them uh, can certainly produce worsening pain as well. Their immobility makes it... Um, uh, potentially worse. Um, they may have back pain, for instance, and uh, if they have uh, tubes and wires and such in their groin, they aren't able to bend their legs in order to relieve the tension on their back. And these are all things that you as the nurse need to understand so that you can anticipate needs of patients and uh, work to minimize those pains as well. So how do we know that a patient's having pain? Well, remember in the intensive care unit, we don't always have the benefit of them saying, hey, I have pain. So you as the nurse need to use some of your investigative skills to figure it out. So tachycardia, tachypnea, that is fast breathing, uh, and hypertension can all certainly be indicators of um, pain. So can pallor or uh, flushing, um, you know, people have red faces and such as they get uh, more pained. Um, other things like diaphoresis certainly can be an indicator. And that also is a particularly good indicator for neurological problems as well. And we're going to talk about those when we get to the neuro section. Um, it goes without saying that uncontrolled pain can have all sorts of negative physiologic effects, um, and you can imagine what many of those are. So we have a couple of ways of uh, assessing pain. Uh, one that you learn as a nurse practitioner is the old cart method, if you didn't learn it yet. Um, old cart is a mnemonic that we can use to remember um, the components of the history of present illness. So when we're taking a history from somebody, we want to find out what's causing their pain. So for instance, um, early this, uh, earlier this week or last week, I should say, I had a patient who came in with, um, some squirrely sort of chest pain. And so I needed to get to the bottom of what was, you know, whether his pain was cardiac in nature or non-cardiac in nature. So I started out by asking about the onset. Does it happen suddenly or is it gradual? Um, where is it located? Is it retrosternal? Is it, uh, you know, in the, um, uh, in the side of their chest. Um, what is the duration? Does it last just seconds at a time? I know that's not from the heart, but if it lasts, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and uh, feels like a heaviness or a pressure or tightness or a squeezing, those are all things that are characteristic of um, uh, cardiac pain. Aggravating factors like exertion, is it exertional? Do you get the discomfort when you're um, walking up and down stairs, carrying groceries, um, 
having intercourse or doing anything else strenuous. Um, where does the pain go? Does it go into the arm or neck or jaw? Those are also indicative of cardiac pain. And then what treatments have you tried? Have you tried sitting down? Does that make the discomfort go away? Um, did you try nitroglycerin? Did that help? Did you use antacids and did that help? And all these things together can help us get a good idea of what the pain is and uh, what the patient has already tried for it, etc. Um, the PQRST method is specific to pain in particular. And so um, this is a, just another method that we can use for uh, how did these uh, symptoms appear. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant that it's not specific to pain. Um, it's another method similar to old cart. So provoked pain, what provokes it? What's the quality of the pain, radiation, all the same sort of things, just a different mnemonic. So pain scales that we use, and you know we may use different ones depending on who we're talking to. If we have a patient in the hospital who is seven, we probably don't want to have them use a zero to 10 scale. Uh, it might be easier to have them use the FACES pain rating scale, and you can see both of them are uh, shown here. It's really dependent on who your patient is. What if your patient doesn't speak English? And you don't speak whatever language they speak. Um, do you think a, a 1 to 10 scale is going to be good where you can explain to them that a 0 is no pain and 10 is the worst possible pain? No, probably not. Maybe the face thing works there too, right? Um, although it's made for pediatric patients, it can be used uh, in a cross-cultural uh, environment as well. These are two other pain scales that I'll let you look at uh, in your notes as well. So how do we manage pain in the ICU? Well, like anywhere, severe pain is treated with opioids, and we use a lot of them. We use oxycodone, we use morphine and fentanyl and all sorts of other uh, opioids. We like opioids, they're effective, uh, and we can control them so we don't have as many uh, issues uh, or concerns about um, patients' getting more than they need. Oh, by the way, the side effects, as you know, are respiratory depression, hypotension, CNS depression. Those are major problems with uh, opioids that we have to be aware of in the ICU. Also, the fact that it causes decreased gastric and GI motility all through the gut uh, means that constipation is a major problem. And if our patients can't get out of bed and walk in the halls and they can't maintain good hydration, that's three strikes right there uh, against good functioning bowels. So what else can we use if we don't want to use opioids? Well, there's tons of non-opioids out there, and we start with acetaminophen. And at Hershey, they happen to have IV acetaminophen, which is, um, well, I'll, I'll let you decide for yourself uh, how efficacious IV acetaminophen is. Um, I think those of you who have tried Tylenol for headaches and found that it's not terribly helpful would probably be hard pressed to recommend that your patient um, would get good pain relief for serious pain with acetaminophen. Remember, acetaminophen is for mild to moderate pain. Let's leave it at that. And said similarly, good for moderate pain. In the hospital, we have Catorolac or Toradol, which is an IV form of an NSAID. Uh, other NSAIDs are ibuprofen, uh, for instance, and all the other um, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There's Altram, which used to not be a scheduled drug, but because of its um, usefulness and the fact that it does uh, affect the opioid receptors um, has now made it onto the schedule um, of uh, addictive drugs in the U.S. Lidocaine patches are really good for cutaneous pain, uh, and we use them quite a bit in that regard. There's also adjuvant pain management, uh, including benzodiazepines. That's very useful. Corticosteroids can be very useful because they are very potent 
anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, tricyclic antidepressants can be helpful as well because although they don't treat the pain at the stimulus site or the transmission along the uh, spine, they do affect the, the brain's um, interpretation of pain. And they are very powerful in, um, uh, in pain control clinics uh, in particular for the long term. So non-pharmacologic management of pain uh, by nurses in the ICU involves repositioning. That's a big thing. Hot and cold therapy, you know, put, uh, put something warm on it or use ice or whatever. Um, there are some other things, too, that are useful in distracting patients. Um, music therapy or just letting patients hear something other than the alarm sounding and all that. Um, when I was, uh, working in the, uh, heart surgery ICU overnight, I often had patients who, um, you know, would start to wake up from anesthesia and would feel, uh, very anxious. And, you know, I usually had a radio there and I put some nice soothing music on. Uh, I usually turned off the, uh, uh, the hard rock stuff at that moment, but, um, but music therapy can be useful too. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, you don't need to play your guitar for them. You just, uh, you, you just have it turned on in the background. It can be very relaxing, particularly if you know what that patient enjoys. Um, so palliative care is another thing that we can talk about. Um, palliative care is useful for, um, patients and their families who are, uh, navigating a very um, uh, difficult time in their care when they need, uh, they're not ready for hospice, um, but they're not engaging in the full, um, the full court press toward a cure. All right. And we see um, palliative care be very useful for these patients who, you know, we may not have much else to offer them to help them live out their lives uh, to the fullest. So the things that nurses um, concentrate on when they have a patient who requires palliative care uh, are the things that um, patients are most concerned about, right? Uh, typically, when patients are in the palliative care phase, they're not concerned about uh, longevity of their lives, but rather uh, about how can they feel the best during the time that they have left. So controlling their pain and anxiety and hunger and those physiologic needs uh, is very important. And again, nursing interventions are very useful in doing that. And that's why patients appreciate their nursing care so much. So let's talk about sedation now. Uh, remember that there are indications for sedation. One of them is for mechanically ventilated patients. When we have patients who require the ventilator, we need to make sure that they are um, breathing appropriately, uh, appropriately and not bucking the vent, as we say. Um, and if we can sedate them and take away their own urge to breathe uh, by just making them sleepy and uh, th then we see very good results with that. So typically we need that when patients have severe respiratory failure or ARDS, because we sometimes use funny, uh, uncomfortable, um, ventilator settings that, uh, are not easy for patients to tolerate. So we need to sedate them for those. Also for, uh, treatment of increased intracranial pressure, sedation is, uh, useful and in fact, mandatory in many states. Um, refractory status epilepticus, you know, seizures that we can't uh, get under control, sedation is useful. Um, and then critically important is sedation for patients who are on neuromuscular blocking agents. I want you to remember the scene in uh, at the very beginning of uh, Jurassic Park. If you remember when Dr. Grant was out in the field and they were digging up dinosaur bones and the little kid comes up to him and says, you know, it doesn't really look like a, look like a bird to me, more like a giant turkey. 
And Dr. Grant goes over to him and he has that claw from the Velociraptor. And he says, you know, you might want to give these thing, these creatures a little bit more respect because if you were trapped out in the in the wild with them, they would hunt you down and they'd attack you from both sides. And the, my favorite line is where he says to him, and they rip your guts open. He takes that claw and rips it across their belly. And then he says, but remember, the point is you're alive when they start to eat you. And so think about that when you think about neuromuscular blocking agents, because you're alive and feeling everything when they start to cut you open. What do I mean by that? Well, neuromuscular blocking agents are given before surgery. We give them in the ICU as well to make patients unable to move their muscles. It does not have any effect on the brain at all. And so if you have a patient who gets neuromuscular blocking agents, make sure you sedate them before they get the neuromuscular blocking agents. Just last month, there was a report that a um, hospital, well, actually it was um, um, Vanderbilt University Hospital in Nashville um, was potentially going to lose their Medicare um, license. And what happened was there was a patient who went down for an MRI and needed to be sedated. And so the nurse grabbed the neuromuscular blocking agent and administered that instead of sedation. And what happened was the patient was unable to breathe for an extended period of time. And they were wide awake the entire time. And then they lost their um, pulse, went into cardiac arrest, and they died. Now, there are many reasons that this tragedy happened, and it wasn't entirely the, um, the nurse's fault, perhaps. I don't know what the, what the deal was. Um, but remember, never forget that neuromuscular blocking agents do not, do not, sedate the patient. They do nothing to the brain. All they do is prevent you from being able to move your muscles. Okay. So other indications for sedation you can read here. I'll let you read that at your leisure. When we have a patient who needs sedated, we have to balance their, um, their sedation between being under sedated, in which case they remember everything and they feel pain and um, maybe don't have good mechanical ventilation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have to balance that with over sedation, which can prolong their mechanical ventilation and make them stay in the hospital longer and increase their complication rate and uh, potentially potentially uh, lead to more ventilator associated pneumonia cases. This is a very important balancing act and nurses are really the ones who drive this. And so that's why, um, things such as ventilator associated pneumonia is a nurse sensitive outcome because nurses are the ones who are driving this train. At Hershey medical center, um, these are the guidelines for sedation at the institution that you work at. You'll have your own guidelines for sedation. And remember, if you don't know what the guidelines are, you can always look them up where in the policy and procedure manual for that institution. So sedatives, remember, uh, moderate the anticipatory pain response. So, um, sedatives help to take away that um, sense of dread that the patient has when they're about to have some uh, painful procedure. They don't treat pain though, right? Not all sedatives have analgesic effects. So remember that um, benzodiazepines, for instance, may sedate patients. They are hypnotics, but they don't have an analgesic effect. Okay. Um, there is such a thing as chemical restraint 
Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. That's where the uh, patient is given these drugs just to calm them down and sometimes make it easier for the nurse and the medical team to do what they need to. Sometimes that's indicated, but often it's not. Um, there are different agitation uh, sedation scales, and this is the RAS scale, uh, and then this is the SAS scale. So uh, whichever institution you work at, uh, they will have picked one or uh, one of these or made up their own or, or something to, um, so that we all are on the same page uh, about sedation. Commonly used sedatives, um, propofol has to be given by anesthesia um, or by a critical care physician in most um, organizations. Again, the place to go for that uh, to find out for sure is the policy and procedure manual at that institution that you're working at. Different rules exist, uh, and that's why you look up those um that's why you look up those policies and procedures. But in general, um, this is used in a mics per kilo per minute fashion. Uh, we change the tubing every 12 hours. Um, we um, like it because it has a quick on and off. Uh, if you've ever gotten it for a procedure that you've had, uh, you know that very soon after you um, – stop the propofol, uh, you're wide awake. Now you might not remember a lot of it because there could be those effects, but, uh, but you do wake up, uh, fairly quickly. Okay. There are some cautions to be, um, uh, exercised in patients who have allergies. Um, and they also have dyslipidemia on here as a potential problem because it is a fat, uh, lipid solution, uh, that the, that the propofol is delivered in. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, usually doesn't prevent us from using it though. Benzodiazepines, other ones, um, midazolam is very short acting. Lorazepam is much longer acting. Uh, and we, we like benzodiazepines because they have lots and lots of effects, right? They are sedatives. They are also an, uh, anxiolytics. They make your anxiety go away. Uh, they can be useful in uh, seizure disorders because they're muscle relaxants as well. There's all sorts of good things about benzos. The problem with benzos is that they are CNS depressants. So when you're on a CNS depressant, um, if you reverse that CNS depressant suddenly, like, uh, you know, stop drinking alcohol, cause that's a CNS depressant. You've been drinking alcohol for a long time and then you suddenly stop, you can have a seizure. Same thing with this. If you're on uh, Ativan for a long period of time in the ICU and then you get reversed instantly, um, uh, with Ramazicon, then you can have a seizure. So we try to avoid that. Uh, and if we're going to use these drugs, we need to keep in mind that the patient has been on it for a long time. They need to remain on it at some dose so that their brain doesn't wake up and freak out. Uh, other sens uh, sedatives that we use, Presidex has really taken over for long-term sedation. Um, it's nice. It doesn't have respiratory suppression, uh, but it does... Uh, cause some bradycardia and hypotension, so that's an issue. Fentanyl is very useful as well, um, and the benefit to that is that it also treats pain. Um, but you know, since it's an opioid, uh, what the downsides of that are. And ketamine is useful. We typically see ketamine um, as something that anesthesia pulls out of the toolkit once in a while, um, but we're starting to see more and more uses of ketamine. The other uh, thing that you should be aware of is this thing called a sedation vacation where we wake patients up um, periodically just to make sure that they're still there neurologically. They can move their extremities and uh, follow commands, etc. Uh, and then we see how well they're uh, you know, able to follow commands and breathe, etc. Um, we know that when patients wake up and breathe intermittently um, during a long uh sedation course that they tend to do better. Um, they have, um, uh, fewer mental status problems as they come out of anesthesia. Um, when we have patients who are getting neuromuscular blockade, uh, or paralyzation, we need to 
make sure that they're not getting too much. And the way that we do that is um, we monitor their uh, their twitch response. So we'll get to that in a second. But remember that we sometimes use neuromuscular blockade uh, in the operating room. So for instance, if we're doing abdominal surgery on somebody, uh, you can't have their abdomen um, tensing up every time you use the bovi, right? Or uh, stimulate their, uh, you know, with electrocautery, whenever that electricity goes through the uh, bovi blade, uh, it would stimulate the contraction of muscles. And we can't have that because it would, you know, cause damage. So we paralyze those patients when we do abdominal surgery, for instance, also joint surgery and, uh, and all that. We also use paralytic agents in the ICU. And we do that to facilitate um, uh, ventilation sometimes, uh, or if they have brain injuries or other things like that. All right. So remember, they need to be sedated first. And then uh, we add the paralytic on top of that if we need to. Uh, these are the indications that I sort of went over quickly. Um, some commonly used ones are norcuron uh, and succinylcholine. Those are slightly different agents. Succinylcholine here is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent. The others are non-depolarizing. That is uh, unimportant for our purposes right now, but uh, know that succinylcholine is uh, used mostly for induction in anesthesia, uh, and we tend to see um, the non-depolarizing agents like norcuron or vecuronium used in the ICU. Um, it depends on what facility you're at. Um, I think more and more facilities are going to the physician-only administration of paralytic agents. Um, but uh, again, check the policy and procedure manual where you are and know that the patient has to be sedated first. If you didn't catch that yet, shame on you. I'm sure you caught it, so good for you. So how do we monitor these patients? Well, we monitor um, sedation with this bispectral index monitoring or BIS. And this uses the brain waves um, uh, in assessing their level of sedation. So this is a trick that they've been using in the operating room for a long time. Turns out it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's a much, much better, uh, thing than just our best guess about somebody's sedation. And again, we are particularly interested in how sedated people are when we are using neuromuscular blocking agents, because remember neuromuscular blocking agents, do not sedate. So we have to make sure that we, uh, although they are unable to move, we need to make sure that they are also adequately sedated. And that's what this tool is good for. So um, you'll learn about how to do BIS monitoring when you uh, take a job in critical care. Uh, we use this scale, the BIS index range, uh, to figure out where patients are. We certainly don't want them to be flatline on their ECG, uh, but we don't want them to wake up and respond to our voice either. Um, now, there's also um, this uh, trains of four which is a way for us to assess uh, somebody's neuromuscular blockade. So what we talked about before with the BIS, this is for monitoring sedation. And trains of four is so that we can monitor neuromuscular blockade. And what we do is we affix these two um, uh, electrodes here, uh, or you can do it on the ulnar surface of the arm as well. And then we have this little device that, um, that sends an electrical signal across the nerve and we can monitor then how much, um, movement there is. So when we have patients adequately blocked, we see, um, uh, two to four, uh, two out of four twitches, uh, or 80% of the receptors are, uh, where 80% of the receptors are blocked. And that's where we tend to like it. Two to four uh, in that neighborhood is uh, is usually sufficient. There's a video here for you to watch. I'm not going to play it right now. I'll let you do that on your own. Um, 
and then we'll just move on here to caring for a sedated patient. Remember that uh, you need to monitor the sedation of these patients all the time, ongoing physical assessment, because they're not able to move on their own uh, necessarily. You will need to move for them. And so patients who are paralyzed in particular, you need to make sure that you're uh, addressing their potential um, uh, pressure sites, uh, but anybody who's sedated too uh, is less likely to be able to move and do what they uh, need to. So turning, repositioning, skin care, nutrition, you got to do it all for the patient. Okay. Let's move on to nutrition since I just mentioned it there. Um, remember that in critically ill patients, they have a huge metabolic requirement. So you know, it's one thing for us to feed our bodies when uh, we're, you know, healthy and normal. We don't have wound healing that we need to do. But a patient who went to the operating room and had a Whipple procedure or had a thoracotomy and heart surgery or whatever, they have a ton of healing that needs to happen. All those cells that were destroyed or, or cut through when the, um, when the surgeon did the operation, uh, all that extra um, healing needs energy. And the way you get that energy is from nutrition, right? So, um, so we need to make sure that we're providing that nutrition for patients. And it turns out, you know, we used to think that, um, it didn't matter and patients, you know, we never fed patients. And then we started thinking, you know, I think patients probably do need to be fed. And then we started thinking, well, if some's good, more's better. So let's feed them right away. Well, it turns out it's not right to feed them right away. They don't, patients don't do well, trauma patients in particular, don't do well when you feed them, you know, the day after their um, injury. So we're still trying to figure out exactly what the right time to feed people is. Um, but, uh, you know, that's an ongoing science. How do we assess patients' nutritional status? Well, uh, we know based on their age, right? Um, we know that children have different nutritional needs than um, young adults, than uh, the elderly do, etc. cetera. Um, patients' dentition matters, right? If they don't have teeth, then it's going to be hard for them to chew steak, for instance. If they can't swallow, that's a problem. And if they're on medication that affects their nutritional status, those are things to all take into consideration. Their laboratory data, for instance, uh, I had a patient the other day who um, had a ton of edema and um, was getting ready for surgery and they sent her home so that she could get some more nutrition because of all this edema she had. Well, why do you think she had the edema? Well, it had something to do with the fact that her albumin, her serum albumin was 2.8, which is way low, right? Um, so those patients who have, um, abnormal labs, um, that's one other way that we can assess, uh, those patients. So what are the ways that we can feed people? Well, we can use parenteral nutrition. This is kind of a last resort. Uh, it turns out that the liver does not like being uh, fed through the arterial system, right? So the liver is used to detoxifying things because it goes through the portal system. So the gut gets the food. It absorbs that stuff into the um, the vasculature of the gut, and then it goes for first pass metabolism directly to the liver. And using the portal vein system is how it does it. When we feed patients, though, we put it in through their vein, it goes to the heart, and then it gets pumped to the liver through the arterial system, not through the portal vein system. And so the arterial system sends the blood flow to the heart, and that's where all these nutrients are. And now the bot, now the liver goes, whoa, this is way too much. And we see problems as a result of this. Patients who are on TPN for long periods of time um, tend to have problems. And there are many problems that they have, and um, uh, they include uh, a higher risk of infection. They include elevated transaminases or liver enzymes, uh, all sorts of things. <laughs> 
Nevertheless, for short terms, uh, for the short term, it can be useful. And sometimes patients whose gut isn't working need total parenteral nutrition through a central line. Or if they only have peripheral venous access, then we can use partial uh, peripheral nutrition um, or PPN. Ideally, we always want to feed people through the gut. That's the way God made it. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so we would prefer to um, feed patients through the gut using an NG tube or a, a, a feeding tube or an NJ tube that goes into the jejunum. Um, these are the ways that we like to feed patients. Now, there's two different kinds of stuff that we can use. We can either use elemental feeds where there are things like, um, you know, Jevity or um, Osmolite or some of these fancy things that are essentially already partially digested. They smell awful, um, but it's easier for the patient to digest them because it's already partially digested. And then there's the other stuff like Boost and Ensure and things like that. Um, and the, the standard enteral feeds that... Um, that the patient has to do all their own digestion with. But those, there are many different um, um, enteral nutrition um, supplements out there. So what is the nursing care for these things? Well, first of all, we have to place the feeding tube. And again, check the policy for the institution that you're at. Um, how are they supposed to be secured? These are a couple of ways that we do it. But remember, skin is a problem for many of our critical care patients. And so you have to have something that um, is safe to use on the skin. Uh, we have to maintain these devices with placement monitoring and checking residuals, although those, the tube walls are very thin and they collapse when you try and check residuals in many cases. Uh, so usually we don't check residuals in feeding tubes. Uh, again, check your policy and procedure manual. Uh, when we're feeding patients, do not lay patients flat. That's a really important thing because of aspiration uh, precautions. When the head of the bed is flat, patients can aspirate much easier, and we certainly don't want that. That gives them aspiration pneumonia. That's a very bad kind of pneumonia, uh, and um, you can really hurt your patient. So anytime that you flatten the bed, turn off the tube feed. That's a rule. So here's a couple of uh, x-rays. Notice that this um, feeding tube goes down into the stomach, goes past this, um, this thing here. This is the hemidiaphragm, so we know we're in the gut somewhere. See this line here? That's the diaphragm. This is a breast, actually. This is the diaphragm. And you can see that it goes into the stomach, and it turns around, and it points toward the duodenum, but it's nowhere near. Down here, we can see that this feeding tube goes right down the main stem bronchus, and this is going directly into the lungs. So we certainly don't want that to happen, right? You wouldn't want to feed a patient through that because they would get aspiration pneumonia. What we're looking for is the tube to come down um, under the diaphragm. Here's the diaphragm. And it comes down uh, into the stomach. Here it tends to, oh, sorry, I'm giving you the wrong one. This is a regular NG tube. The feeding tube comes down here, goes around this way, follows the curve of the stomach, and it crosses the midline. And that's how we know that we're in the duodenum because it crosses over the midline. So how do we place these tubes? Um, that's a skill that you'll learn in the skills lab. And um, we want to prevent problems like uh, placing it into the lungs, as I showed you there. Um, we'll talk about this in the skills lab uh, when you have that um, shortly. Nursing responsibilities for feeding tubes. Remember that they have to be ordered by the physician or a uh, advanced practice nurse. Um, we have to do the feeding tube assessment. Typically, if you measure... Um, uh, the distance from the nose to the ear to the xiphoid, that's the minimum amount of uh, space that they need for the, um, for the tube, or that's the minimum length uh, of the tube to get into the stomach. Um, you'll have to assess their bowel function. Oftentimes these tube feeds make people have diarrhea. It's a mess. 
Um, we have to maintain the patency of the tube uh, and know when to hold tube feedings again if the patient has to be wide, uh, has to be laid flat uh, or anything less than 30 degrees of the head uh, elevated, then we have to uh, keep that in mind. Um, TPN always requires two RNs to hang. Uh, remember that there's a lot of uh, glucose in TPN, and so those patients are at higher risk of infection. We use a single port on this uh, central venous line, uh, and only TPN should go through that. We monitor blood glucose and any other labs, uh, and then plenty of patient and family education is uh, necessary as well.